before we hand it off to to Evan. A um, couple things is this is the last day of Celiac Awareness Month. I'm not sure if you guys all knew that, right? So enjoy the last day. There's <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things that had popped up on the, the Facebook page. The one that, the first one on my list is the Zero Tolerance website, and I'm not, uh, I'm trying to find someone that wants to take up the reins with that. Um, I don't have time to do that, um, and I don't know. I, I, I feel like there was a couple of people that were interested. I just need to get the details from Joe about um, how much is he pays for that and all that kind of stuff, right? So I don't know if any of you guys have any uh, interest in any of that stuff? <laughs> nope. <laughs> once once all this uh, COVID uh, stuff is done, I'm going to be super busy. Otherwise, I mean, yeah. I'm, I've never maintained a website before, but. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably reach out to the folks that, that had mentioned that they were interested in that. So we'll see what they have to say. So. You know, I've been tinkering with, with a wiki for the last year and a bit. I talked to Joe about that. We never really kind of formalized how that would work but it's different than a website but and, uh, yeah i mean a wiki would I, I think as long as it's somewhere where there's a good resource and uh um for knowledge that the facebook page just honestly kind of sucks for that right so it's hard to find stuff right yeah it's really hard to find stuff so things like you know like homebrew talk where it has a forum message message boards you know that's good to as a resource, but it's kind of like crickets in there in terms of the amount of content for the gluten gluten free side of the house. But yeah. I don't know. It's I know that it was just gonna that website was just gonna die off unless um, someone wanted to take it over. But we could do something completely different too, right? So how far did you get on the wiki road, though, Stu Stuart? Uh, I've got a sketch of different things but like a wiki i mean the idea would be to have would have uh, other people contributing to it so it doesn't have to be it's a it, you know it'd be a work in progress kind of thing um yeah i found a few hosting places i've got one on on a like a, just a personal website so it's not it's not something i would want to launch but there are some places that would host wiki like you know sort of wikipedia style wikis so we could take we could take that up if you if you want to talk offline you can yeah let's do it uh, offline that sounds good yeah. That sounds really cool. So uh, next thing is Ju the June meeting. So for the June meeting, um, announced here for the first time, I'm gonna have Jim Eckert from Eckert Malting and uh, Brewery come on and cool. uh, discuss um, his operation there. And you know, we've never really had a maltster perspective, so I thought that'd be pretty cool to have um, Jim on there to discuss uh, everything, uh, you know, rice malt. Uh, so I'm really excited about having Jim on the on the next meeting. It should be the same, you know, last Sunday of June. Cool, that's great. The other thing I'm doing is I'm starting to do this. Uh, um, it's like a brewery interview series. I did my first one with Jason Yeager from Mutantis. Um, I'm gonna be posting those interviews. They're like 20 or 30 minutes. That I'm gonna be posting to YouTube and the Facebook page. So. Look for that pretty soon. Um, I might have to get in touch with uh, with Bob. Um, you only got twenty minutes with Jason. <laughs> What's that? You only got twenty minutes with Jason. I wanted to keep it. No, it's actually a half hour. We could have talked for like three hours, right? Yeah. So, but I wanted it to be something that, like these meetings, the YouTube videos of these meetings are super long, and they're not really. No one really wants to sit through. I think like a two hour long. Yeah. You know talk about mead right so they're gonna fast forward to the highlights at least yeah. exactly right um i'm gonna try to do a little bit more video editing as well to edit out all the kind of nonsense nonsense what, you mean right? my yeah. my my jokes what no yeah, all your oh uh, yeah all your jokes <laughs> delete <laughs> yeah they were half cocked anyways 
what else? So I guess that's probably it from a uh, housekeeping side of the house. So um, we have a special guest, uh, Evan Crane, and he is, a, you're a PhD candidate, right, Evan? With yeah, the University right. or with Washington State University Crop uh, Crop Sciences, uh, so I met Evan at the and Peter was there as well at the Magic of Million presentation, which is at, was at Ghost Fish. And this was it seems like a million years ago, but it was actually I think in March, early March or late February or February, and mm. that was a really great presentation. There was uh, Lindsay from uh, Grouse and Evan and Brian Thiel from uh, Ghostfish did a really excellent presentation <coughs> about all things millet. And so I reached out to Evan to see if he would be willing to come and um, kind of join a meeting and, and kind of review some of that information. So I completely ripped off from the Washington State uh, University uh, website a little bit about Evan. So I'm going to read that here for you today. It says, Evan's dissertation focuses on breeding quinoa and barley uh, for flavor and nutrition. Evan is especially interested in developing technologies for high throughput phenotyping of end-use quality traits and develop developing interdisciplinary disciplinary collaborate collaborations. I don't even know what any of that means. He's passionate about bridging the gap between farmers, stakeholders, and consumers to support the development of regional grain economies. Evan enjoys facilitating tastings to engage the public with sensory perception of regional agricultural products. To appreciate something, you must understand it, and to understand something, you must experience it. So welcome to Evan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, is it okay if I just go ahead and share my screen? I just have yeah. some, some slides yeah. to show yeah. some pretty That'd pictures. <laughs> See if maybe you could, it says it, it's disabled the screen sharing. All right, so technical difficulties. Let me see what we can do here. Uh, make host, all right. All right, so I made you a host, so try it now. Okay, it should be up now. Yep, um, yep, we can see it. Okay, cool. So yeah, thanks for that intro, Kale, and everyone that's here. And I'll just say that although I'm using a PowerPoint and it seems really formal, I welcome anybody to just jump in and ask questions whenever they come up. Um, Kale and Peter have seen some of these slides before, and I'll kind of go through them quickly because I'm really interested to hear from you guys about your experience either malting millet, brewing with millet, those sorts of things. Um, that would be really great feedback to hear because um, a lot of my research is with barley and barley malt sensory, beer flavor, and we're, we're just starting to get into those same areas of research with millet and buckwheat. So I'm just going to focus on millet today because that's what most of the work in our lab has been on is millet <clears throat> rather than buckwheat. So I'll just jump into it right now. Um, this is our research group at Washington State University. and We're located in Pullman, which is in Eastern Washington. I know we've got some people from the Pacific Northwest here today. And so in the top left here is our, uh, our PI or principal investigator. He leads the research group. His name is Dr. Kevin Murphy. And for about eight years, he was the barley breeder at WSU. And now he focuses on international seed and cropping systems. So a lot of the, the research that he's led has been on barley, but we've also done research on alternative grains. And those are just basically anything that doesn't fit into our typical commodity cropping systems around here. So that could include things like millet or buckwheat, uh, but also quinoa, which is in the center here, one of our research associates in a field of quinoa. And um, 
things like hemp as well. Uh, he's done a little bit of organic hop research. So there's, there's a good interest in, in beer in our lab for sure. And so this is how we have defined ourselves on our website. If you go there, you can see that. But some of the core things that we focus on are bringing diversity to our agricultural landscape. So if you've ever been in Eastern Washington or like the Midwest, for example, you see a lot of the same crops grown and I'll talk about a little bit why, why that might be. So we're focused on trying to bring new crops to cropping systems and, and to facilitate that, we were, at least for my research, it's focused on end use quality, which just means how can we utilize these crops? What's their, their, their best end uses? So an uh, example of that is, is barley and beer, but we also work with food barleys and different food products, uh, quinoa in different food products, as well as uh, beer and then millet, uh, beer, food products, the same story. Figure out which uh, crops work best and which products. And then also we're really interested in the varieties. So at bringing that plant breeding perspective, we're trying to develop certain varieties that have desirable characteristics and that could be things that are advantageous for farmers like yield, disease resistance, but it could also be for end users. Uh, new flavors or textures, functionality, so better baking quality, for example, or better malt quality. And so that just helps to facilitate adoption of these new crops. If, they, if there's a market for them, then they're more likely to be used. And I'll talk about that a little bit with millet as an example. So millet in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it, it's a big question mark. It's not grown a lot. I know one farmer near us that grows it on occasion, and it usually goes into the birdseed market, which uh, is actually a market that doesn't pay for the crop. So he subsidizes his millet production with the sale of his other crops. And you might be wondering, why would you grow millet then? And a lot of the benefits of millet I'll talk about, but he's focused on growing millet first his soil health and it fits really well in his rotations with his other crops. So to understand the role that millet might have in the Pacific Northwest, I want to just talk about where millet is grown a lot and that's in the Great Plains. So half of the millet production in the U.S. is actually in Nebraska and in Nebraska, uh, Colorado and Wyoming, um, these cash grain bids represent how farmers can sell their millet. So this is getting back to that marketing idea of how are you gonna sell the crop uh, that you grow? And so there's infrastructure in these states that support millet markets. And so that's why, especially in places like Colorado, um, where you might be getting a lot of your malts or from other places, I'm curious to learn where you guys are getting your millet malts, but it's because of this infrastructure that supports growers that we, we see a lot of millet produced in these states. So there's actually grain elevators where you can drive up and you can sell your millet to the elevator. Uh, there's also grower contracts. And then there are actual breeding programs as well, like ones in Nebraska and Kansas State that's developing varieties that perform better for farmers. So those all, all things fit together to support the, the marketing of millet and the production of millet in those states. And millet fits into the cropping system well in the Great Plains. And I've listed some of the crops that are grown along with millet. Uh, it's usually planted after wheat. and It can help control weeds and conserve soil moisture because millet has a, sh a shallower root system. But because of that, it, it can't access deeper soil moisture reserves or soil that's, or soil moisture uh, that crops like sunflower and wheat can. So it I leaves have a part of the, yes, go ahead. Uh, in what percentage nationwide is it planted after wheat? Um, I don't know the actual percentage. Um, it would usually because be- in terms of certification, like uh, say you planted oats after you planted wheat, that mm -hmm. field of oats could not be certified as gluten-free because it's grown in the same field that wheat was originally grown. And therefore, it's got me worried that almost all of the millet that we buy is planted after wheat, which would explain why a lot of people can't have millet beers. Like, 
uh, Michelle Pagano, who's the beer babe on Instagram, she has a lot of trouble with millet specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm not sure. And that actually has come up before. It came up at the ghost fish presentation. And uh, I've asked some folks that work in the gluten-free baking industry about that. And they just try and work with farmers that grow mostly gluten-free crops. So all the way back to the field, it's gluten-free certified. And that's right. the best way that they can ensure there's no contamination through their whole supply chain. And so that's right. a unique challenge that the gluten-free market brings. But uh, if you have good grower contracts and you're, you have a good relationship there, I think that can alleviate a lot of that risk. Just that unknown is unknown. Yeah, I mean, it's worth asking, you know, because like there is, uh, I mean, there's, there's international millet growers now, right? There's growers in Argentina that people like us at Divine Science are talking to. There's uh, maltsters in Ohio that are also producing white millet. That's of interest to companies like ours. So it's a, it's a potential question that we need to pose back to these producers to really make sure that you know, if we are going to go, you know, either a multiple source or single source through them, that it's at least done responsibly for our end client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob, I think uh, I think in the case of grouse, I, I believe the the farmer that's supplying the millet uh, for them is is uh, gluten free certified. I that makes sense. Yeah, I mean that's why we're currently buying exclusively through them. But at the same time, you know, when you're looking at, you know, creating a, uh, a an affordable product you also have to shop as well. Mm -hmm. sure. So that's one of the things that's still important is that you know, you, if you forget that fact, then you could potentially be making a product that wouldn't be safe for the end client. Um, mm -hmm. so do you happen to know what the secondary plant, uh, like corn, soy, sunflower, that might be after wheat? Or is it sorry? always millet, yeah. Or is it always millet in those fields? I think it depends a lot on the farmer, but I, I just use this example of, of wheat um, because I think that's maybe the norm, what you might typically see. So yeah. that might be one way to work around this issue that you mentioned is um, putting it in the, in the field after another crop that, that is gluten-free. Right. Um, yeah, that, might be, that be, might be one opportunity there. Interesting. Yeah, very, very, uh, uh, I, I'm very happy I'm seeing this slide. It's really uh, important to know this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at least with our, in our area, the, the main rotation is a winter wheat followed by a spring wheat and then a pulse crop. So that could be, it's usually garbanzos is where the market is right now, but historically a lot of lentils, split peas, things like that. So, so I think millet would fit in maybe that spring cereal, as we call it, like that spring wheat slot. Uh, they would grow it after their winter wheat, and then they would go to a garbanzo. But I think it would depend a lot on the farmer, their, their equipment, their rotation. But important things to consider when you're sourcing, for sure. Yeah, very important. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm going to go to the next slide now. Um, so the, yeah, these are some of the challenges of growing millet in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a lot of tra trade-offs here, just from some of our trials that we've seen, things like getting a frost in September will hurt the crop and you won't be able to have a mature crop. Uh, birds, actually. I mean, there's a reason millets in bird seed, right? Because yeah. <laughs> bird, birds like it. And so that's something we've seen in the field. Um, yeah. And then summer precipitation here in this sort of Mediterranean climate in the Pacific Northwest, if there's not a lot of summer precipitation and you have to wait to plant millet until the soil temperature warms up, then you might have issues with uh, getting that crop to harvest. This is just a slide showing what Cedric here in the bottom has done at WSU in our lab with millet projects. Um, there's actually many different species of millet. So he's been evaluating these different millet species and then looking at things like effects of fertilizer. And so that's important for a farmer who's trying to produce millet, might not have grown it before. There may not be examples from other farmers in the area of what works. So trying to take some of the risk out of that decision-making process for the farmers. 
And then uh, some of the food quality characteristics of one proso millet that's popular around here, which is Huntsman. And then also working in Rwanda where he's from on uh, some millet projects. And this is just another example. We had an intern that, that did a, a screening of different millet species, uh, different varieties that we hadn't looked at before. And this is kind of what our landscape looks like in, in the Pacific Northwest. So he was actually really lucky to find some flat ground because it can be tough to do some of these trials on a hill where you have a lot of different variation in the field. Right. And then I wanted to talk about the, the market. So this is getting back to a key question and this is uh, where, where my dissertation focuses with quinoa and barley, which is looking at end use suitability and how that can help with marketability. And there's actually been some good press um, about millet in the Pacific Northwest. So this came out, I think in 2017. And uh, this gentleman here, Jeremy Bunch, runs a, a growers cooperative near us called Shepherd's Grain. And so they really like millet in their crop rotations, but they're having a hard time uh, finding markets for it. And that bird seed example I gave, he's a shepherd's grain grower. So uh, they're helping subsidize the millet production because of the benefits it has agriculturally. Huh. I mean, I'm waiting on my email. <laughs> we'll keep you in mind for sure. I'm, I'm gonna move into something that we're, I'm really excited to share, which is, uh, grant proposal we actually submitted last week for millet and buckwheat research and so this if we're invited to submit a full proposal then we'll maybe be reaching out to to more stakeholders and growers to support the project but we have uh, nine growers and 11 different stakeholders and those stakeholders include everyone from mills to malt houses uh, we had a letter of support from ghostfish actually so great this is getting back to the idea of trying to bridge the gap between all these different players in the supply chain and try and get some crosstalk going to support adoption of crops like millet and buckwheat in our area. So um, the themes that we really hit on with this proposal, it's mainly focused on diversifying what we call farmscapes, so just a landscape on the farm. And we're trying to add value to rotational crops like millet so that farmers have more incentive to grow them. And one really good way to do that is through value adding like malting or milling and then getting them into food products. But uh, a lot of people are unfamiliar with those products or those crops. So trying to uh, do education and outreach to educate people on that is a big uh, goal of this grant. So. I'll just show kind of what we're trying to do through this project. It, a lot of it would be focused on in the first year, just seeing what farmers are growing and how can we use those varieties. So I don't know if when you guys get your malt, you know the actual millet or buckwheat or rice variety that's in it. And if you notice a lot of inconsistency in your product, if, you're, if you don't know the variety, but um, so Evan, when you say variety, are we talking about like proso versus finger Oxford. or? Yeah, those would be, those are the millet species. So like that example I gave of Huntsman, yeah. that's an actual variety. So right. um, yeah, yeah. from the, the plant breeder perspective, your varieties are, they're distinct. So they're different from anything else. They're unique. And their characteristics and they're uniform so they're consistent and so that's right. important for the grower but it's also important for like end users we yeah, we get we get our we get i mean everyone here gets their millets i think majority is from grouse and i don't know is it proso millet that they use for all their their it's version? definitely white um I, the toilets told me that it's white but that i don't know what the most commonly white millet is well, it's, it's proso, right? But I, but I guess to your point, Evan, I mean, is it, is it Huntsman or is it Sunrise or, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. think about in the barley malting world, those, those malt sheets for what people are growing in any particular year, are, is, that's a, a big deal, whether it's yeah, exactly. Harrington or something else. And I, I'm, you know, with one malt, one malt house for millet in North America, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't I'm curious to know. What yeah. that looks like and 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 from your perspective how significant is that in terms of 
yields and uh, you know the, the different factors you know that that matter to brewers. Yeah, so that's um, that's what we're going to do. Try and figure out the first year is kind of what people are growing and and then what can it be used for, and so trying to bring those crops to market. Um, the second objective is just focus mostly on variety trials. So evaluating things in the field. And then this uh, third objective would, is gonna look at, um, and I'll just talk about the malt side of things, because the food sides I'll come to a little later, but look at, uh, do some micro malting of these different millet varieties grown in different environments and look at their malt quality, do things like malt sensory on them, brew pilot beers with them and try and look at how those different things change when the variety changes. So trying to get at what Stuart was talking about, you know, there's certain, there's a variety identity for certain barley varieties, things like Maris Otter. Um, you know, you mentioned Harrington. Copeland is one that we compare a lot of our breeding lines to because it's grown a lot in Washington. So I, it's hard to find that information for millet. I, I'm curious to know if you guys are, you know, pr privy to variety identity when you're working with the millet. It sounds like probably not. So that's something we really want to start getting information published on, you know, grow these varieties, maintain the distinct varieties through this evaluation process, and then say, um, you know, this, these millets might be better for malt, while these millets would be better for something like a bread mix or, their, or a food product. And presumably they're going to be different regions that they're going to do better with with certain varieties. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah, do so we, we have different outcomes in the Pacific Northwest versus the uh, middle yeah. of the country? Yeah, exactly. So uh, the variety trials would evaluate the, the millets in areas around Pullman, but also in southeastern Idaho where they have access to irrigation. So we'll be looking at how that can influence the, the quality of the crop that's produced. And then there's a lot of text on this slide, but uh, this is the, all focused on education and outreach. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show a little bit what we've been doing with barley that hits on this. So um, we're, we're applying a lot of the tools that we've been using for barley to these new crops. So when we think about breeding for malt quality, there is a lot of balancing that goes on between these various stakeholders. So a lot of what my research has focused on is talking to brewers, talking to maltsters, doing consumer panels, um, trying to, to balance the needs of these various groups because when we're breeding for our production area, sometimes we're just prioritizing the farmer's needs. So good disease resistance, high yielding varieties, things like that. But the earlier that we can start selecting for things like flavor or malt quality, things that matter to people in, in this region of the star, uh, we might be compromising some of what the farmers need. And so that's where the balance comes in. And that's what we've started to do is look at barley varieties that are good for malt quality more holistically. And so looking at their, their malt quality, their sensory properties and agronomic properties to figure out what best meets the needs of people in, in this supply chain or in what, what we call a regional grain economy. So. Oh, okay. It was to which hop you said? To Homa? Home, to Homa. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Mm -hmm. Well, adverse IPAs, it depends on what kind of beer they like versus how they respond to the sensor. So they're going to like things better than it's crazy. So this is, this is just a, a fancy figure that we are able to make through our statistical analysis. But what you see here is the, in the red, these are some of the attributes that were significantly different based on what the consumers perceived in the beers. And so, like I said earlier, we had one that was really highly associated with citrus. Uh, certain, and Copeland over here, that was our control. People perceived it more as stale and earthy. 
this over here was the beer people liked the most. And so they really liked the sweet aromatic and fruity flavors in it. Um, we also included some off flavors too. So chemical, we had a, uh, people who perceive that. We also included butter as an off flavor. And then we, we gave people the chance to give us comments. So some people perceive like bubble gum, um, vegetal things, soap, stuff like that, off flavors that, that uh, weren't balanced enough to, to stay in check there. And I think I just, oh yeah. And then of course, like, what are people gonna pay for these beers? So we asked them, um, I think on average, most people pay like just under $7 for a craft six pack. So that's mostly where people fall, but you can see that the majority of people would buy these beers. So that was good to see. Um, this beer, which was like the most overall, uh, had the highest number of people that would pay at this higher price point. Whereas this beer uh, down here, uh, which was the really citrus one, uh, it's a little lighter. Um, a lot of people liked it at this lower price point. So this was helpful for the brewer who collaborated with us on the study because he was actually had access to larger amounts of these malts. And so he brewed follow-up beers with these two uh, sister lines here. And same recipe, just scaled it up and had really good feedback. And so this one was released last year as a new variety called Palmer. And then this one's being considered uh, for release uh, this upcoming year. And this sensory data is the first time in the history of the breeding program that they've had this beer sensory data as part of that, uh, what we call a release package. So it has uh, farmer feedback, variety trial information, and now we have in addition to the malt quality, we also have the beer sensory. So it looks like this is gonna be continued to be used in the breeding program to help inform some of those selection decisions about what ultimately makes it out to the market, which is really exciting. Evan, in, in the barley world, what's the, the timeline between a, a, a breeding trial and actual uh, release that where maltsters are, are starting to use that? Yeah, so from when you make the initial cross with a male and female plant to when it is put out for release, it takes around 12 years for that to happen. So it's a pretty long runway. And so that's a caveat of breeding for flavor is that might be a moving target for consumers. So when you're taking these consumer preferences into account, uh, it might work when you're on the cusp of releasing something, but um, when you're looking at a longer runway and where you're trying to breed for in terms of consumer preferences and flavor and when you're selecting that, it becomes a much more difficult task. So, And I um, guess that's, that's also an established process within the molting barley breeding molting world. Not, presumably, we're not there at all. This is like brand new ground for for millet or molting millet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, I did get to meet the millet breeder at Nebraska and I don't think mm. he's looking at malt at all. He's mainly focused on food. So mm. yeah, the, looking to something like barley and, and how people are approaching uh, malt quality and sensory could be really useful for developing those same tools for uh, millet. But I mean, totally different crops and there's gonna be different challenges you know, how you measure malt quality, some of the tests. You know, for barley, we're looking at enzyme packages, alpha amylase, and DP. So you're gonna be, I mean, those aren't gonna be big considerations for some of these other grains, but other factors, you might have to develop tests, standardized tests, or use different tests so that you can define malt quality in a different way. True. I, I'd also like to point out that a lot of uh, craft gluten-free beer drinkers are paying fourteen ninety nine for a four pack. And I'd like to point out that we have some Canadians on the call here, so you need to have this chart in loonies, not in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Just double everything. Quite <laughs> <cool. laughs> That's why we make our own, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey
So what's what's driving that price? Is it just the, the grain, raw materials? Grain, yeah, the grain costs, right? Yeah, it's, it's twenty five bucks for a fifty pound bag of barley, but it's eighty bucks for a forty pound bag of millet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was one way that we proposed measuring impact for that proposal I was talking about is how much does ghost fish spend on malt from Colorado right now, and could, is there a way that we can offset some of that with millet that doesn't have to travel as far to make well, it. Well, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob does big batches. He has his own divine science uh, label and uh, contract produce. So how much does it cost you for a uh, big batch? Uh, like, I don't know what you're brewing uh, size wise. How much does it cost you for grain for a batch? Yeah, I mean, it's at least $1,800 just for the grain on a 14 to 15 barrel batch, at least. This that's without using anything crazy. Like I'm using a uh, biscuit, pale millet, and then maybe some like dehusk rice or some like crystal. That's at least the IPA. The blonde has even fewer malts. I'm only using millet, biscuit rice, and corn in that one. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going lower, lower ABV with that one. I pretty much all malt on my IPA. The IPA when we were first doing it, it was t almost $2,500 just for the malt fill on that, on, that, on that original recipe that we've taken about 300 pounds out of because we've been able to get better extraction through our enzymes. Yeah, so uh, what was that, from a barley perspective for the same pounds of uh, grain, I mean, that's, oh, oh, what's the percentage difference? In so yeah, you, just made, you pretty much divide it by a factor of about four. So okay. uh, I, what is that, 18 divided by four? Well, you said about this, like how many poundage do they use? Oh, pounds? Yeah, well, they use a little bit less poundage too, right? So like where I'm using on certain batches, I'm using about 900 pounds. They're using about 600 pounds for the same amount of ABV. So there's also that impact as well that like the, that, I mean like, I think when you're looking at these prices, the prices is because it costs less like 30 cents to make a beer. Whereas like some of, some of our beers cost up to a dollar to make per beer. Yeah, and the majority of that is the grain cost, right? That's. Oh yeah, it's a yeah. huge element. I mean, hops are fucking expensive. Like, oh my God. <laughs> We were paying up to $22 a pound for Mosaic when we first were doing our recipe because we weren't buying it on contract. Like, it's crazy out there. I mean, like Nelson Salvin, that's why some of those beers are so expensive because it's like $30 a pound. It's a good hop. It's a great hop, but it's also just like outrageous when you're looking at it and trying to make it at scale. Right, mm -hmm. right. Right, like I just, I just, I literally almost cried when Mill 95 told me that they had sold out the 110 pounds that I had asked for of Cascade, that they were gonna sell to me for a dollar a pound, right? Because that's just like unheard of, a dollar a pound? Oh my God, yes, I'm gonna buy as much as I can buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was something that we, we really honed in on when we talked to brewers about some of these barley varieties is that there may be flavors in the barley that you can bring out by pairing with the right hop or just by using the right variety of barley so you don't have to lean on hops as much to create these certain flavors. So, wow. you know, this, this one, I mean, we put in, I, I think it was, yeah, the, it was, the Tahoma hop, I mean, compared to what you typically put, it, put in a recipe, this was like a tenth of that. It was mainly just at 60 minutes for bitter to right. balance the malt sweetness. Does anybody grow grains and hops together that you've met? Really, like both, like vertically integrated? Yeah. Um, not that I've usually separated. Not that I've met, but um, would it be bad though? You could do it. You could do it in um, anywhere you have irrigation, I guess, like in the center of Washington. So, like Yakima Valley or. Um, around there because I think, I mean, that's where most of the hot production in Washington is and they have access to irrigation. So um, they could put in some fields of barley. I think, I'm trying to remember the name of the brewery I've seen. They have a series, uh, it's like their homegrown series or something like that. Uh, they're in Yakima Valley. They grow the hops and they grow the barley and they've been releasing beers in this series that feature both. Okay. So they're, 
Yeah, they're integrated in that way, which is pretty interesting to see. Thanks. So yeah, that's that's really all all I've got. Uh, if anyone has questions, be happy to take them. Do you have a timeline for when these kind of this whole trial and everything? I, I missed a little bit in the beginning. Maybe you covered it, but for when you're doing this kind of same thing, apply it, applying it to Millet. So we just submitted that pre-proposal for the grant. And if we're invited for the full proposal, we'll know that in August. And so the yeah. first year of the study, if, it's, if that full proposal is funded, would be the summer of 2021. But what, what we're hoping is that through some of our preliminary groundwork connecting stakeholders and growers that we might be able to even if we're not funded, we might be able to solve some momentum in that direction. At least in our area, a major challenge is, is finding a malt house that's going to dedicate equipment and space to gluten-free malting. So I think- Well, there may even be some people that wouldn't want that, right? Because of the risk of cross-contamination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, having even dedicated equipment, yeah. Is it important that everything is done, you know, certified gluten free or whatever, you know, separated and everything for your trials? Or can you at least get the legwork out of the way in an easier, cheaper fashion by finding someone just to at least malt it? Even if there's some, you know, contamination, it's not safe. You can have a judging panel of non celiacs or something do that, you know, right. portion of the assessment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. That's something that we'll probably end up doing just because it's more. It's logistically it's going to work right yeah, yeah i'm exactly. guessing it's less speed to market and more about the the research at this point in time just yeah, trying I mean, to understand if you can bring research about you know strong research that's done at other facilities to grouse and these you know other places yeah. they might be more inclined to actually do something with it you know yeah yeah evan what's i mean like in terms of just expectation setting you know how barley's had a little bit of a of a jump start on millet for <laughs> for mil malting purposes so in terms of you know like creating a, a malting millet that i don't know whether it was larger kernel sizes lower gelatinization temperatures greater diastatic power i mean what's what's a reasonable expectation for seeing changes to those things is, is that again something that will happen over a few hundred years or is this you know is you know, does it depend on how much uptake and interest there is or is it is it really down to the number of years it takes to to get a single ascension or or, or a, a breed right into, through the trial process i think it depends on how much money stewart's going to invest <laughs> <laughs> i thought that was you <laughs> hey yeah, I really, I like that question a lot because the way I think about it is there could be a breeding approach where we're starting with that goal and we have this long runway to get there, or it could just be discovery where through these variety trials, we're growing things that people may not have grown and we're evaluating in the ways that haven't been evaluated before. And so we're discovering there's already something out there that's, there's already a millet that's a great malting millet. It just hasn't been given that attention and focus to discover. So that's kind of what I'm hoping from the study is like, we have really good varieties already. Um, we just haven't spent the time to evaluate them in a careful way with that specific purpose, purpose of malting. Well, it's not like millet has not been used as a um, a grain for brewing beers throughout history. I mean, throughout like history in Africa and all sorts of places, the that grain has been used to you know brew with, right? So it's not like something that's just brand new. I think that it just seems like a lot of the you know European influences and um, the current brewing practices are all all you know you know, focused on, on barley just because it naturally had um, the enzymes and gelatinization temperatures where it's like, you know, just add some hot water and let it sit there and you're going to make, you know, fermentable wort out of it where it's a little bit more of a challenge for, for us with millet because of the way that that grain is structured, right? It seems like it's mm -hmm. more difficult to extract. Uh, it's more complicated, right? Yeah, we, you know, we like to make shit really fucking complicated here. Uh, 
<laughs> Twice as hard to brew and four times the cost. Woo! Yeah. Welcome, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, yeah. On page eight of Tasting Beer is a picture of Millet Beer. So Randy go. Mocher even knows about it. Yeah, so. exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, I, I read a book. It was, I think it was called Ancient uh, Brews or something like that. And yeah, it's one of the oldest uh, grains that was used for brewing in the world, right? So it's definitely something that's been around forever, right? So um, well, let, me, let me get your take on uh, creating a market uh, where there isn't right now, right? Because it seems like there is a market in the Great Plains, but in Eastern Washington, mm -hmm no market at all right and how do you get from is that what you're you know i guess that's kind of what you're trying to get kick started um mm -hmm. what do you see like as a success uh, five years from now if you were mm -hmm. to have your way what do you see like as a success i would say some some sustainable relationships between growers and stakeholders so Growers have the opportunity for contract growing of millet or buckwheat. That's really the goal of that project is proof of concept that there is a supply chain there. We just have to bring all the links together. And so in, at least for buckwheat, it's de-hulling and roasting. If we can get that equipment in the Pacific Northwest, we might be able to overcome that. And then for millet, in terms of getting it into beers, malting is something that needs to be overcome. Um, I, I think that's a good way to measure the impact. And then something that we also did with that pre-proposal is uh, we have a letter of support from the Washington State Department of Agriculture. They have a regional markets team that sources grains and a bunch of other products for public schools. So that's one way that we're also going to measure impact is if we can get some of these crops into public schools and start with younger kids creating interest and just awareness of that they exist and that they can make delicious food and um, obviously won't be using the beer in that capacity but um, you know millet millet breads quick breads uh, buckwheat pancakes things like that just trying to diversify the fields and palates that's kind of the title of the the grant so Millet flour is clutch when making good empanadas. That's good to know. We don't have that as a potential product, but maybe we should have. Yeah, we have the quick breads and pancake mix and noodles as, as our target food products right now. Yeah, buckwheat noodles are great. My, my favorite is buckwheat soba. I've had it in Japan at a three-star Michelin restaurant. It's incredible. Is, I've heard it's hard to find without any wheat, though. Like, it Very usually hard. has That's a little bit I'm of wheat. I'm wondering why this restaurant gets three Michelin stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really crazy. Uh, when she delivered the, the, the plates to the table, she said, please eat quickly. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I heard gelatinization temperature come up quite a few times, and... I think I have a slide at the end here that I didn't show. Uh, some research that was done on that with quinoa. Um, so this is a lot to look at at first, but just to orient you, these are all different types of quinoa grown in Washington uh, or sourced, sourced commercially. And wow. these are, uh, here's your, uh, your like onset of gelatinization, your pasting temperature. So these are, uh, pasting properties that were measured. These are, uh, this is like flour swelling potential, water solubility index, so like cooking loss uh, for things like that. And what they were able to show with quinoa is that we can form these, uh, these like end use classes based on these properties. So over here, these would make really good baked products. Um, up, and then down here, because you don't have a lot of that cooking loss uh, and low flour swelling potential, these would make good products for things like spaghetti. And over here, these would be better because they don't have great products for like uh, baked goods that require a lot of uh, rising. These would be better for like dense baked goods. So like maybe a scone or something like that instead of a bread. Uh, and then these circled ones, they had unique properties based on their water absorption and their, their pasting temperature, they'd be really good for, for making like a, a slurry. So maybe 
just like a functional food ingredient in like uh, baby food, for example, like that kind of viscosity that you might need in certain products. So something like this is what we're gonna do if we're funded for the Mill and Buckby project because a lot of this information isn't known in, as far as millet and buckwheat for certain varieties. So uh, hopefully we'll have a figure like this come out with millet and we'll know which ones actually do have a lower gelatinization temperature and those might be good candidates to move towards the malt side of things instead of the food side of things, even though they would make good, uh, good baked goods. So. Wow. Um, That's crazy. Dude, <laughs> wait, so wait, wh are there any on this graph that are actually like better for brewing or is this just specific to food? This is just specific to food. I'd have to go back and look at the data for the gelatinization temperature because I have had people ask me about that for quinoa, uh, but these <laughs> weren't malted. These were just milled into flour. So I don't know how much that would change that measurement, the gelatinization temperature. There. Um, it sounds like an average human question. Can I get drunk from it? <laughs> <laughs> Only time will tell. Yeah, hopefully. I, I don't know. Do you guys brew with quinoa at all? Yeah. Use it? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people do. As uh, just for like head retention, or what's the, what's yeah, the purpose of including it's it? For That's head a retention, yeah. function. I think that there's some people that, I've, I've been on homebrew talk, I mean, there's some people that brew exclusively quinoa beers, so. Yeah. There's yeah, actually a beer just... that's available in NorCal. I think Ben can vouch for this one. It's a gluten-reduced beer, but it's partial, uh, partial barley, partial quinoa. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, I don't even know if I've seen that, but it I, mean, has I think we just... I typically like just put awesome. a little bit for head retention in certain certain styles or something. You know, I threw some in my hazy uh, IPA that I made just to add a little body and head. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we we had a quinoa symposium planned for this summer. It's now virtual because of everything that's going on. But we were going to try to have some uh, new breeding lines of quinoa because we do have a quinoa breeding program at WSU. Um, malted and then made into beers and people could try them and uh that's kind of on hold right now but we are working with grouse and ghost fish on that project so that would be awesome because right now there's no malted quinoa really out there at least that i know of you know it's just mm -hmm. you can get flaked quinoa which from what i understand is not really much of a difference because quinoa just cooks itself so easily you know you can just chuck it in there and i think it does pretty much the same thing but yeah uh, yeah, so Evan, the, is there any potential for for uh, people for people at home to, uh, to to plant any of these varieties? I mean, how would how would one go about getting a, a millet variety to, that to might be used in a trial? Or, or you know, it's hard enough to find proso millet generically for a yeah. home home growing and home malting. Is is there any is there any black market for this kind of thing that we can tap into? <laughs> For millet, uh, I'm not sure. I, I would twilight recommend seed. like- Millet seed, twilight, twilight will sell, sell you millet seed if you have a corporation. So there you go, there's one option. Um, if you have any like regional seed companies near you, like I, I'm trying to think of some up in BC, like um, is Uprising like in uh, Northwestern Washington, they might have millet, I don't know. Um, a lot of these quinoa varieties are being picked up by seed companies around us, like um, Wild Garden Seed mm. has a quinoa, he has his own quinoa breeding program and has released varieties. They're actually on this list. Um, French vanilla and cherry vanilla are, are some of Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seed. Is anybody I from think Oregon on this call? Is anybody from Oregon on this call? Because like Bob's Red Mill, I imagine, they probably have corn seed too. And they have bulk bins like in like the Oregon market. Like they have like a mm -hmm. you know box red mill like big hub. I wonder if they just have it in the full form, or if it's all baked or kilned. Or yeah, something. I wonder if if it's irradiated or you know with that with that uh, make it difficult to grow. Yeah, I mean like you can buy bird seed and you can malt it. I mean you can you can literally go to the feed store. Oh and yeah, you, no, no. I know I'm just thinking if you if you were interested in particular varieties. So if, if oh, uh, yeah, in, yeah. Your, okay, like in your research you guys find that there's, you know, two or three 
different varieties that have some real interesting potential be it would be fun to tap into that and just you know at a domestic scale try growing and molting that up but yeah yeah i i'll keep you in mind as we do that <laughs> all right yeah <laughs> sounds good yeah yeah, Stuart doesn't want the crappy millet. He wants the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. premium. <laughs> premium, baby. Apparently he's got tracts of land to grow it on. <laughs> A whole island. Yeah, Bow and I, the Bow and Island Seed Company, right? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> now that we our other cash crop is legalized, we gotta we gotta look at some other areas. So <laughs> it's afraid it'll be expensive to get it from Stuart though. <laughs> yeah, the shipping is like terrible. Well, cool. Uh, thank you for uh, for joining. Um, I don't know if you had any. You, did you go through all your material? Yeah. Yep. Cool. I think that that covered it all. I can stop sharing if if that works. Yeah, that's cool. Anybody right. else have uh, any other questions for for Evan? What do you have to say for yourselves? Sunday beer drinkers. <laughs> Stay drunk. <laughs> no, it's interesting stuff. Uh, good luck with the uh, with the grant and and the research trials. It sounds really interesting. Be interesting yeah, to have you come you. back yeah. in a year or two and and give us an update. Is, is there somewhere we can follow you slash follow the progress of the studies and things? Is there like an update feed anywhere or something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for that particular grant if it's funded we'll have a dedicated website to it which will be really cool so that'll that'll be like our information hub but we have a pretty active social media through instagram um and i'll put that in the chat so you guys can can follow us on social media and you can also visit our website um yeah i'd say instagram is the best uh for that sort of thing just because uh cool cool photos and project updates make it on there quite frequently. And Evan's uh, on a member of the Facebook group, right? So I'm sure if you got any links or if you um, get this mm -hmm. approved, um, we would happily love to know that information so we know what's up. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I, I see some, some unique opportunities through something like this group where we could send out millet malts, you guys could do like a hot steep and give us sensory feedback or something like that. We could kind of crowdsource that sort of research. That's You'd have a lot word. of interest. <laughs> you would get a yeah. lot yeah. of yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be really neat. I think uh, we could, yeah, I'll keep that in mind for sure. I mean, also we're gonna open some, up some to of the international chemo. shipping. If you open what, up sorry? international shipping, there's a lot of people in the UK and like, Europe right now where it's very hard to source that kind of mall so okay. they, I think they'd be really interested in it as well that's good to know across the pond <laughs> yeah well no it's crazy I mean like you'd, you'd be surprised how many people just somehow don't understand what gluten-free actually means in places like Europe where like they have codex wheat which is apparently a gluten removed version of wheat that finds its way into gluten-free foods in Europe and it's not necessarily about the absence of gluten that a lot of people have a problem with. It's actually the presence of these specific grass peptides in people's guts that's causing a, some sort of a re, uh, reaction, whether it be an allergic or intolerant reaction. There's a lack of understanding around it. And that's where you get gluten-reduced beers allowed to market themselves gluten-free in markets like UK and Europe, uh, which I believe is, uh, I, I mean, I, some people can question the ethics and there's times when I do, um, but I think what we need to do is bring more education to this because that's when people will understand it and realize, oh, okay, that's why we have to go outside of the barley, wheat, rye spectrum and look at these other grains, uh, these alternative grains, is because for some, re for some people, that really is the only option. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that gets forgotten in all of that. They're worried about legal limits and parts per million and all this other stuff that the gut doesn't care about. The gut doesn't care about the parts per million. The gut is going to respond as though it's an intruder in very many cases for people like me and my wife and the people that are in this group. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the things that I really want to see is just the, I mean, like, you, I guess COVID's really shining a bright light on how different 
the world is responding to the same thing. And America, you know, we can talk about its own responses, but one thing that we really look to is other countries like Europe and we edify them in so many ways. And I'm so disappointed that that's something that I can't edify them at, you know, at. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally agree. Well, we're lucky to, uh, to live most of us where we do, right? Where we have easy access to gluten-free grains, even though it's super expensive. And uh, I, I think Evan, Evan's got like, a, you know, I think the end state of what Evan's trying to do is to create more of a market for those grains and more sustainable crops. And that equals, you know, if that happens, then there's going to be more of these crops being grown and the cost is going to get driven down because there'll be more of a market for it. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, in the end, maybe that looks like, um, you know, several more malt houses that are gluten-free that you don't have to pay for crazy shipping from Colorado to get your, you know, eight, eighteen hundred dollars worth of grain for your brew. Right. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. Right. Kale, your capitalism is showing. <laughs> well i like i i just it's it's when you when you press the uh the you know the button to place your order for something like that it's like damn i wish you know some part of me wishes that it was like way cheaper to get this this uh these I've, grains, right? I've had comments on my articles on homebrew talk where people are like those kind of costs i would never brew and you're like right well, then i would it's, never drink <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those things where I think that it that's the case for a lot of people. They just simply just don't brew because it's too expensive, right? They'll just you know do cider or wine or just not drink at all, right? Because if you're spending the amount of money we probably spend on an all grain brew, um, even at the homebrew level, level, not not even talking about um, you know large scale brewing, it's it's a pretty big investment, right? And okay got to really want to do it i think um, yeah it's, yeah it's a passion project at, at least at the first onset and then when you uh when you get to a certain point you can start charging other people for it you know that's a it's a big step to take yeah i don't know i i wouldn't i i would be very nervous to spend eighteen hundred dollars on grain and like <laughs> hope i didn't fuck it up right <laughs> <laughs> hope it works out <laughs> dude at scale uh uh the dehusk gas hog is four dollars 14 a pound <laughs> right yeah. and we yeah. had two uh so we had we had 50 pounds of that in our in our a forthcoming stout and then we had like dark rice we had like three or four different kind of dark roasts in there uh so it's just like honestly it's a it's a really crazy space to play in because you know one of the things that you also understand as a you know when you start a brewery is like your first up to five years is potentially all net operating loss right you're you're hoping to be like a ghost fish that can be basically almost almost nationwide at this point right i mean they're yeah. doing really yeah. great things Big number. um and and that's that comes from dialing it in and really working to perfect every recipe. I mean, my, my two least favorite flavors of ghost fish used to be kickstep and vanishing point. And I just recently had them in February and they're now two of my favorite ghost fish beers because of the way, the, where they started with those recipes and where they are today. It's, it's incredible to watch that progression of a brand really get what product quality management is and what that looks like in an executable fashion. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what are some of your favorite flavors from Ghost Fish, Kale? You get to have them all the time. Well, um, I mean, my original favorite Ghost Fish beer, because I love high gravity beers, was Peak Buster, right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he's a cheap date. I like it. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> But as I've kind of gotten, gone, uh, you know, on a, I've gone the spectrum of, you know, oh, I want this beer because it's like nine percent. That's awesome, right? Uh, to I, I kind of like the, 
I think that like the Kickstep IPA is probably one of my favorites. And then just because I, I feel like it's the greatest sorghum beer that has ever been produced is the grapefruit IPA. Right. Yep. So I yep. think like that is straight up the best sorghum beer that's ever been made that I've ever tasted. Mm -hmm. Right. So sure. those two. There you go, man. That's legit. But pretty soon I'm going to be making like non-alcoholic beer or like 3% beer. <laughs> yeah your quarantine's been hitting you hard but <laughs> no i just like as i get older i feel like it's going like you know, can't handle it anymore I need, like, I need like old man beer i thought you were talking about the quarantine 25 or the quarantine 15 you know that people are complaining about <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> it feels like that too right <laughs> yes yeah. I agreed. Yeah, I mean, my favorite beers are the ones that I can drink all day, right? I mean, that's why, you know, our second flavor to market was like a highly sessionable 4% beer is it's like, I get drunk off my IPA off of like two of them, man. <laughs> like, right, right. That's shit to do today, you know? <laughs> Session beer. Right? I'm, 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 I'm drinking my wife's beer right now because she can't keep drinking the home brews because they all are above like 5%, 8% are our double is like oh knocks you on your ass. <laughs> so it's like Canadian beer then. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's great. Dude, really good connecting with everybody again. I've, I missed the last one. I'm trying to be more regular with these. That was a great speaker. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah Evan, thanks, Evan. Uh, that was, that yeah, was cool. yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. I really Thank appreciate you. all of you. I wasn't sure if you're still on. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing. All yeah, right. Great questions. And I, I really appreciate that. Good feedback too. It's just really exciting to talk to people where a lot of this research could have a big impact. So I'm excited about it. For sure. Yeah. So, Send yeah. us the malts. Yeah, we want to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we want to play with your malts, man. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> All right, y'all. I'm out of here. We'll catch yeah, you later, thanks everybody. so much for everyone for joining. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Evan. Hey, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next month with uh, Eckert Malting. Take Hell care. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks.